So kia ora again, welcome everyone to our first COVID update of the year, um, looking at just at red uh, level at this stage. Uh, so I think um, everyone's on mute, that's great. We've got a few people on today, so um, if you pop answers, uh, questions, sorry, in the chat or um, pop your hand up, um, I can't always see everyone's hands um, and faces. So yeah, the hand up um, little function or your questions in chat um, are great. Um, just a wee reminder as always um, to check that your school is on the National EOTC database. Um, particularly at this time of year, if you've had um, changes in who's um, lucky enough to have that role in your school, make sure that that comes through to EONS to update so that information is going to the right person um, in your school. And of course, um, check with your neighbouring school that they've got someone on um, board as well. Um, this whakatoki seemed particularly appropriate to start with um, today, uh, given that we're all in this together um, and uh, we can do it. Hello. And it seems um, appropriate to um, just remember that, you know, it's a challenging and uncertain time for everyone. I've undone that. We're, um, out there trying to do the best we can for our students and keep up to date with, um, you know, in a sometimes very rapidly changing environment. Um, so good to be patient. Um, I'm going to assume that um, everyone's found the EOTC um, guidance that EONS has on our website. And I'll just expand on some of the points that have changed the most few options. or okay. where I've had lots oh, yeah. of questions. Uh, um, and try and leave lots of time at the end for uh, those trickier questions that the guidance doesn't necessarily um, answer. Uh, so some key messages. Um, keep a track of the Ministry of Education guidance, yeah. um, particularly the, their guidance. Um, sorry, that must be a setting um, at your end. Um, if you could just mute though while you try and work that out. That I can't hear you. Oops. Oops, hopefully that will get sorted out. Um, so that guidance does change um, as new legislation comes into place or interpretations change. What um, EONS does is we follow that guidance really closely. We have good links with the ministry team. And as soon as guidance changes or new legislation um, comes into place, we update our legislation. Um, there is you know, a bit of a gap there at times whilst we wait for the ministry to approve the guidance that we're putting out and we always go back and check that with the ministry to make sure that uh, our thinking is aligned with theirs. Another key message is um, to think about doing what's reasonably practical, um, pragmatic uh, responses and um, looking at the settings and things that you have going on at school and how those would look in an EOTC situation. Also very key, particularly with the changes that have come in this year around working with external providers, that you have those really good robust conversations with those external providers. So you are agreeing how those events are taking place and what's required to make them run smoothly. Now, as always, but really important to make sure you're all on the same page. Ah, so just touching on a couple of things that have changed. Um, physical distancing, okay, no longer such a thing, particularly within groups, okay, so there's no requirements within your groups of students. Um, between groups, we're talking about a metre between groups, and then with members of the public when you're out and about in EOTC, two metres wherever possible. Now, there's lots of examples where um, that two metres becomes problematic. Um, you know, I'm thinking of walking along a single dock track. Um, so think about other strategies that you can put into place to mitigate um, where you know, distance becomes a problem. You know, like 
training your kids to look away, um, you know, thinking things through um, so you can mitigate uh, the risk of being closer than two metres to the public. Uh, I'm getting lots of questions about um, larger groups of students and what that actually looks like. Um, and the ministry advice is that large activities with students um, shouldn't go ahead and read unless they're held outdoors. So here they're talking about um, you know, full school assemblies or whole year group assemblies. Um, for all groups, the emphasis is on either a well ventilated space if you're inside or being outside wherever possible. It's good to think about what actually constitutes a large group. Um, because under the COVID protection framework, of course, events and activities can go ahead with up to 100 people at red. So that kind of gives you a ballpark figure to start to think about. Um, you also want to think about how you're working at school. And this is where it, that sort of pragmatic approach comes in. You know, what sort of size groups are students working in in school or constantly socialising in school? Um, you know, if they were in a big pod, can, they, can that pod go on the camp together? Uh, are there other ways to achieve the same outcome? You know, if you've got a, a larger group, you know, 150 at a camp, you know, can you have uh, the meal or the meals in a couple of sittings so that when you're inside, uh, you know, in that well-ventilated space inside, but you're unmasked for eating, you're lowering the number of people that are in there at one time. Um, can you eat outside if the weather plays its part? Now, this is one place um, where there has been change and that, that legislation change came in on the 4th of February. Um, and it created this, car, uh, this sort of um, guidance and this um, ca uh, category that is a, specified EOTC provider. And this is, allows those people or those providers to um, provide activities to students where they're curriculum related, uh, regardless of the student's vaccine status. And they also allow the provider to not comply with the capacity limits. So that 100 um, at red or whatever limit they have um, on their facility. But there's some really strict criteria around what a specified EOTC provider um, actually is. So they have to be able to uh, provide a defined space for your school. So that means either sole use of the venue or a separate designated space for the entire time that you're there. Um, so that would include any uh, facilities, uh, bathroom, et cetera, that you might need. Um, so those couldn't be shared between groups for the time that you're there. Their staff also need to be fully vaccinated uh, to comply with um, these requirements. Um, at the moment, that's just being able to hold a My Vaccine Pass um, doesn't include the booster requirement that the education mandate requires. Uh, and obviously um, you're a registered school when you're working with these providers so that's the other thing that they need to comply with. Um, they can't take these settings and use them with any group, it can only be with a registered school. So you will need to work with that external provider and agree that this is the way um, you want to work with them or that sorry that they want to work with you, it's, it's their choice um, whether they choose to be a specified EOTC provider or work under the um, pre COVID protection framework for uh, events or wherever they have placed themselves within the COVID protection framework. Um, if they've placed themselves within the COVID protection framework um, under events or as an outdoor organisation, um, they uh, may be requiring my vaccine pass. Um, if they do, 
and they're not working as a specified EOTC provider, then you will need to comply with their requirements. So that's where that conversation is really important so that you understand what guidelines they're working or what requirements they're working under. And you can ensure that you um, can agree to those and, and um, meet them. Um, so the other thing that ties in here is when you're visiting venues or providers where others are present. So they um, can't work as specified EOTC providers um, because they can't provide that sole um, use of the venue or a defined space or, or separate out a defined space for you. Um, they'll have requirements that they have to meet. Um, There'll be numbers and there'll be the requirements of my vaccine passes and that will uh, vary depending on the type of business or service they are. You need to have a chat to them and understand what those requirements are so that you can meet those requirements. Um, if they are using my vaccine passes, it's up to the provider um, to verify uh, the my vaccine passes, um, not the school. However, within your planning process, you'll want to discuss with students that they um, have my vaccine passes and have access to them, and they will need to um, show those to the provider, of course, when they're um, 12 years and three months or older. So this is just again, um, working closely with the provider, understanding and making a plan for all of the things that um, you would have normally done, but with a um, eye to COVID over the top of those things as well. And making sure that you have agreed to um, how the settings are gonna work with that provider. And you can use form six out of the EOTC toolkit to help guide that discussion. Uh, now, just very quickly in here, um, when new guidance comes up, we make sure to um, pop an update into, onto the front page, but the guidance itself will actually live under this COVID tab up the top. Uh, you can register here to be an EOTC coordinator, but it's important that um, the site will force you to log in and become a site user before you can do that. Um, so make sure that you're checking that you actually um, got to be a site user before registering. Uh, this is the EOTC uh, COVID page. Um, a couple of things to note, we always change the date here when it was last updated, so you can see if you've got the most current advice when you're looking for things. And um, the session that we're running now will replace this one here um, for you to watch or pass to other staff um, to watch afterwards. Uh, there's a whole lot of other stuff on there as well. Um, there's some really good sites links here um, for the ministry. This is the new bulletin site, um, which is good to keep up and up to date with. And the other two key sort of COVID sites from the ministry. Uh, Sporting Z, obviously deal with all of the sport and school sport um, and recreation type activities that might happen at school that aren't curriculum related. Uh, so the link to their advice is in that um, space as well. Also on um, the website under EOTC management, you can find some general things to do with EOTC. So you'll find um, form six, uh, working with external providers in this area here, um, other Zooms that we do, good practice guides that look at a whole lot of different activities are also in that space. So time for questions now. Uh, does a sport field fall under the category of not having to comply with capacity limits? Uh, depends what you're using the sports field for, um, and if it's if it's on your 
at your school and you're just going there for curriculum related activities um, and you've got sole use of it uh, then yeah you won't have to comply with capacity limits Maybe you can tell them that they're not really tricky. Hear me. Um, hey, Fiona. Um, me. Thanks for all that information. I was just trying to get um, info if there's any clarification or differentiation between an EOT provider and accommodation at the red setting. Just because when you look at the... Um, the Ministry of Health website around accommodation, it just says that accommodation is open, that essentially if the accommodation place is asking for a vaccine pass, then you'd follow that. But it clearly states also that if accommodation is like, if you're not having an event or gathering there, then accommodation can just go ahead under red. So I'm just kind of curious what people's um, viewpoints or what Eon's stance is, if it's not exclusive and you, know that you have students without that aren't fully vaccinated and whether there is um any more guidance around that because it does kind of clearly state that essentially accommodation can go ahead and that only if you're having a gathering or an event you have to follow the gathering or event guidelines yeah, yeah that's so that's where that conversation is really important with the individual provider because some um, campgrounds uh, I think top 10 is an example where across the country they've said um, they're working under a my vaccine pass requirement mm. so if that was the case uh, the school would either need to negotiate like a sole access for that campground or um, they'd have to follow the my vaccine pass requirements whereas other campgrounds you're dead right they don't have to um, put my vaccine pass requirements in place um yeah so i was just curious if there was some guidance coming around like yeah, just how eons, I guess, was whether we were comfortable with that or whether there was some guidance around good practice around that rather than, um, yeah, just letting you yeah. make a call. Yeah, Sorry. so I think um, there's a frequently asked question um, in our guidance around exactly this. And it, it really is the um, school's decision, but I think you need to think really carefully around how you're going to manage um, two meters from people you don't know um, and, you know, that, that's an individual school discussion um, but yeah I think that probably throws up some difficulties for schools around how they would manage controlling intermingling with public that they don't um, know especially awesome. when that uh, accommodation provider is not using a my vaccine pass system for those members of the public yeah awesome thank you um that's great um cheers anyone else want to jump on and ask a question um i've got some in the chat that i can go through uh can i just go back to the question about the sports field so that was my question so i've sure Association with our local sport ground provider and they've given me information that I'm only able to have a hundred students within a bubble on each particular field so when you were talking about a defined space no capacity applies it depends what you're using that space for so if it's sport and it's extra curricular or it's school sport then you need to pop across to sport nz and i see roger has posted the direct link into the guidance um, for school sport and recreation um, it sits on that main um, site that is linked sport nz site that's linked off our guidance um, but they do have a resource that's just there for school sport so thanks roger uh, if it's for curriculum um, then that's a different conversation. Um, and if you can have, um, you can talk to that provider or the sports field provider um, about having um, sole access to that area whilst your curriculum EOTC activity is going on um, and they uh, yeah. 
happy to do that, then um, they can work as an EOTC um, provider. Okay, oh, that's good. So I, I guess on Sport NZ, it'll have a word there that I can take to my provider to convince them. So it's for athletic. If you're using it for sport, um, the, those rules don't apply. This is only for EOTC where it's curriculum related. Well, doesn't athletics fit within the curriculum outdoors? Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> that's an interesting debate. Pop over to Sport NZ. Oh, no. Guidance, I'd say. Um, Sarah. Oh, just pop off mute. Hi guys, um, so I'm, for, I'm an EOTC provider um, and so we're able to operate under the general event and gatherings um, proviso and because we can't exclusively reserve our venue for school groups and because obviously the schools are under their own mandate with regards to vaccination status of students, we, our main query is we don't want to make any students feel uncomfortable by viewing some, asking to view vaccine passes. And, it, and my, my thinking is that because the schools are under their own mandate, they can come to our venue without us needing to verify their vaccine status, even though we're a vaccine pass facility. Because it kind of is, is it they're under a different rule, so to speak? Um, those rules apply to you. So you become the, um, the, cert oh, the specified EOTC provider. Um, and if you can't provide a um, defined space for them, for the school to work in, then you're not meeting your requirements. No, we can, we can receive the school under the general event and gathering in our facility. My main, under the second proviso, but my main query is, I guess it's kind of, how do we mitigate making students feel uncomfortable, like, you know, those that have vaccine passes and those that don't, because we are able to receive them. Um, you can only, well, if you're working under RED and you're, you're using a My Vaccine Pass system for yep. everyone that's coming to your venue, um, yep. you, can, you can either choose to work that way and then the students coming to you have to have my vaccine passes. Yeah. Um, or you choose to work as a specified EOTC provider and you yes. have, to have to meet those three criteria. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's an either or, you, you're not combining those two. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so, yeah. So, hopefully that answers that question. Yeah. Um, if you can't provide that um, defined space, then you have to work under the normal protection framework, let's say, as a venue. Right, okay. Um, a provider requires vaccine passes, but not all students are vaccinated. Um, how do we sit to with students not coming on trips? Students should not be included. Should we replan trips, cancel? What are others doing? Yeah, um, great question. Um, Michelle, it's a very tricky space um, because there's, you know, there's, there's issues obviously with excluding um, students um, and there's a whole lot of sensitivity around um, how do you actually get that information when you're doing your planning. Uh, it's, um, you need to understand uh, the vaccine status of your group of students um, but it's not a question that's, you know, in a class with hands up. Um, it needs to be treated um, really sensitively. Um, and um, you need to make sure students understand they have the option um, not to tell you um, if they don't want to um, around that. And so, you know, looking at how you get that information off students in your planning process so that you can decide um, what venues you can actually use 
Um, obviously, you can use um, specified EOTC providers, no problem. Um, but if you have students that don't have their My Vaccine passes, um, then you um, can't be taking those students to venues or providers that require My Vaccine pass. Um, so it's a yeah, it's a very um, sensitive area to navigate. Does that um, help enough, Michelle? You can come off mute and ask for clarification if need be. Uh, hi, Fiona. Hi, Michelle. Um, yeah, I, yes and no. I guess, like you said, it's really tricky. So we've been toying with um, lots of different processes. So initially, we've been asking teachers or will be asking teachers to contact all the providers and stuff that they do on trips just to check whether vaccine status is even going to be an issue. Um, in the PE area, it generally seems okay. In the more geography history trips that they're doing, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, and a lot of the tourism providers are still saying they require the vaccine passes. So um, yeah, our, our process we're using at the moment is sending the list of the class members to the one person in the school who knows the vaccine status of students, just so she can alert us to the fact of 100% vaccinated or not without disclosing those kids. Right. Um, but my question to you then is, um, where I've obviously continued to encourage vaccination status, um, but how do we, I mean, I initially thought it would be as simple as putting an are you vaccinated on permission slips. And obviously we can't do that um, because teachers can't ask students for their vaccination status. My understanding is then the providers will be asking to view the vaccine passport when we get there, which is what you've confirmed. Um, but how do we kind of streamline that process in between? Uh, I think what you've outlined there is a great process because you're protecting student privacy. Um, you um, you know, you need to know some of these things in your, you know, the vaccine status in your planning process. Mm. And, you know, students can say that they don't want to tell you, um, but then, you know, obviously they're going to need, if you're going to a, a My Vaccine Pass provider, they're going to need that pass. So it's important that you understand um, that if you have those students in that class, then either that's not an option for the whole class going or um, it, it's trying to work out um, how you'd provide the same opportunity for students that can't go to that place. Um, mm. which, which is our next dilemma, actually, is the, is it okay to say, um, you can't come, some of you, those of you who aren't vaccinated will provide a different opportunity. Like, I don't feel like that is okay because no. they are being excluded. Yeah. Um, or is it okay to rename it an optional curriculum trip, but then still students are being excluded? And then if we cancel the trip altogether, the kids who were vaccinated are being excluded. So it's kind of a no, yeah, I don't yeah, really know the way around it. It's a very tricky, sensitive space at the moment. Um, I think, you know, you're, you're doing your best to work through it sensitively. The kind of keys are protecting privacy, mm. uh, trying to include um, where you can, modify. Um, I totally yep. get those geography and history trips. They're super problematic at the moment. Mm. Um, and it might just be that, you know, whilst we're sitting here in red, um, they're just too problematic. Yeah, um, right. And okay. uh, you know, that's not an easy thing for me to say because I just want kids out there all the time. Uh, yeah. But yep. it's being pragmatic and realistic about what we can deliver. Mm. Okay, thank you. Because we're thinking day trips might at the moment be easiest, perhaps. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, okay, so. Doo -doo -doo. Um, anyone had their students visit Doc Huts? Uh, yep, so if you're, even if you're booking out a Doc Hut, um, your students still need to have my vaccine passes. Um, Doc Huts, um, even fully booked or bookable huts, um, they still have to be open to the public. Uh, so um, Doc's policy is the same at the moment as it has always been. Um, since they introduced it, that to use dock huts and camping grounds, you need 
uh, to be uh, fully vaccinated and have your my vaccine pass. Um, so that's why even for bookable huts that are fully booked out by the school, um, you still have to have um, everyone with a my vaccine pass. Um, do providers have to get a document to, to verify? No, um, so as an EOTC or as a specified EOTC provider, you don't need anything else. You just need to have those discussions with the school and work out that that's the guidelines that you're working under. Um, obviously, WorkSafe are the ultimate um, uh, authority over what, how providers are working. Um, but if they were to come and visit you, then you'd be able to point them um, that those are the guidelines you're working under and um, that's how you're meeting those three um, particular points around making sure that um, it's a, only a registered school with a curriculum related activity, there's a defined space and that all the provider staff are fully vaccinated. Obviously all of the teaching staff and any volunteers that are coming with the school are covered by the education mandate for both vaccines and um, the masks, mask use, and, and those settings just come as they are at school um, to that provider's space. Although the provider might, may um, have different mask requirements that they um, could ask uh, staff or teachers to comply with. Um, the example is you know, teachers of um, year four and below that don't have to wear masks at school, a provider may still require those teachers um, to wear masks under their settings. Um, uh, the, um, there's not a register of registered EOTC providers because they don't, um, it's not a requirement for them to tell anyone that they are working in that way. Um, that's, you just talk to them and see that they can meet those three requirements um, or not. Um, and that's a conversation between you um, and the provider. Oh, thanks, Robin. Um, Robin's got a process around student vaccinations that she could share with the group. That'd be great. Robin, do you want to? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if it's explain. I'd quite like it verified because we're using it. <laughs> Go <laughs> um, for it. Um, so we basically have um, two people in the school who we've been sending uh, emails out to the parents saying that we need um, verification of student vaccinations otherwise there may be activities that the students uh, cannot be involved in and one of the options is I don't want to tell you which is yep. the option so that's coming from the parents so we've collected that information and we've kept it in a secure place and there's only three of us have got access to it and so we ask staff before they go on a trip to give us their list of names and then we do exactly how the other person said and we um, tell that person if there are any unvaccinated people and then we've formatted a template letter to send to the parents just to say um, we haven't got information so we'll categorize them as not vaccinated so they won't be able to attend we've just had to draw the line um, and so that way we don't have staff um, sort of identifying the kids we just say look those kids won't be able to go it's the privacy that's our concern yeah, yeah. And what we've also done is when we've had providers like a big place like a pool um, where they do want to run with the vaccine pass we've negotiated with them that will ensure that only vaccinated kids will come because the kids arrive in the buses and it's just too much palaver to scan in every kid so we've just done it we just have relationships with those people saying we won't have any unvaccinated kids there we'll have done the clearance before they leave school and they just trust that we'll get that right so that's uh, for the Sarah that might be something that you do with the schools you just you just have a statement or a contract to say You'll, you'll only send us vaccinated people <laughs> until red is over. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for sharing, Robin. Um, Sarah, you popped your hand up again. I just come off mute. Sorry, I didn't know how to get rid of the hand. I've been trying. Oh. So 
<laughs> I've been trying to remove my hand, sorry. Um, you can just click on, uh, there you are, I'll do it for you. Thank you, yep, it wouldn't work for me, thanks. Uh, no problem. Um, all right, so Bridget's um, put a way of dealing with uh, the senior outdoor ed and going to a pool that requires about my vaccine passes. Um, again, um, it, it's pragmatic. Um, dock camping grounds. Uh, yes, um, the majority of dock camping grounds are captured in their, my, um, their vaccine um, requirements. Uh, pays to pop onto their website and go to the particular camping ground you're after or give the local doc um, information centre a call um, to double check if it's not clear on the website. Um, but as far as I know that most of their camping grounds and all of their huts are covered. Um, good idea to have privacy officer um, for dealing with that vaccine information. Um, <laughs> yeah, Andrew. Um, swimming sports cross country, curriculum or non-curriculum. Um, Inter school, um, that definitely belongs um, in a sport NZ school sport area. Um, and isn't doesn't fit within the definition um, that the new legislation wrapped around EOTC providers. Um, so that sits over in that Sport NZ guidance around school sport. Angus, do you want to come off mute and ask? Your Hi, Fiona. Hi, guys. Hey. How are you? Can you hear me? Yep. Excellent. Hey, um, I, was, I was just... I was just sitting here thinking about the number of providers. So like in Waitomo here, nobody in Waitomo understands what the rules are. You know, so so when people are trying to book a um, an activity in Waitomo, just realize that we don't understand what's going on either. So, um, so I, I'm just wondering if there's some sort of a, a, a whether, whether this, um, can this uh, presentation that you've put together can be shared so that you know people can really understand providers and and people bringing school groups etc can really understand what's going on um because we're 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 desperate for you guys to all come and visit but <laughs> just really don't know what the rules are yeah um, yeah so, um, so this recording will pop up on the eons website on that um a COVID page, you're more than welcome to share it. Um, the guidance um, pulls together the um, information off the Ministry of Education website around the provider requirements. Um, so that might help. Um, absolutely, um, there's an email address um, sitting up on the screen now. Really happy for you to pop through um, questions to that. Um, you know, that comes to me. So. I'm really happy to answer questions. You know, if you wanted to get a group of um, providers together from up there, Angus, I'm really happy to jump on Zoom um, and chat through sort of questions that are really related to um, the schools that you're working with. Um, yeah, I know, absolutely. I know a couple of um, outdoor providers have um, sent this link out to all of the schools they've got booked in kind of to help um, that conversation and shared understanding. Um, yeah. Because it, it is a rapidly changing space. And this legislation, of course, only came in on the 4th of February, right in the busiest time when everyone's trying to get everything sorted out for the year. So, um, yeah. For sure. I, I think we've lost, yeah, we've lost a number of bookings, I think. Um, from yeah. the, the, the education centre in Waitomo, for instance, I think is really struggling. Um, but I, I think, my, from my understanding, where we are allowed to, even though at the Glowham Caves, for instance, you need a, a my vaccine pass to go in to be anyone to, to go in. But if you turned up as a school and had a private booking for the entire cave, then yep, that would be okay. Yep. So I, I think that's the real basics of it, right? Yep, that's okay, as long as all of their staff are um, double vaxxed and um, yeah, you've got the cave to yourself. 
and it's a curriculum related activity with a registered school which it is because it's happening during school time and you know, who doesn't love going caving absolutely yeah uh, yeah yeah but that's cool thank you for that so yeah, i'll i'll get on to it yeah. if i have any more questions i'll send you a, uh, <laughs> thanks Fiona. fantastic thanks angus peter yeah, thanks. Um, great, great presentation. Um, just one thing on pub traveling on public transport, um, thinking specifically for our case with the ferries, yep. we're working with our provider, ideally, that it's only the school on board and their staff. Vaccine passports aren't an issue there, but traveling with members of the public. Uh, so, um, you know, kids, kids are traveling to and from school on, on um, public buses every day. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, they on any school transport, including public transport, they need the students um, need to follow the mask mandate that they are yep. under. So that would involve, um, you know, year or eight year old and above, year four and above um, masked on that transport. No, that's fine. That just clarifies it. Thank you. Yep. Um, Sam's just uh, posted a link to a Herald article. Uh, that came out late January, I think, um, that yeah, helped with some of the uh, questions about going back to school. Right, any other, other questions? Yep, Roger's just popped a good comment up there. Into, school sports subject to gathering and event guidelines and those are uh, on the sport nz website <laughs> i wondered when this one would come up a student ill with covid symptoms or confirmed on a trip or camp now um, you would hope that um, if there's any um, any suspicion about a student before they go on a trip, um, they've had a COVID test before they leave on that trip, that they are not going with you um, on that trip. And I think um, some of the really important things around this point are making sure that you really reinforce with parents the importance of only well students going. You know, and there's all that pressure about missing out if you're sick, um, but it's really important for your trip that, uh, parents have a good understanding that only well students are going and you're doing a good solid health check um, for those students um, before they go so that hopefully you avoid some of um, the issues before they, um, they come on camp. Um, as you would do, you know, at school, it is, it's really important to have um, a strategy for being able to isolate um, students if they do have any kind of symptoms at all, you know, just as you would for, you know, if a student suddenly throwing up and then you don't want um, vomiting and diarrhea to go around the camp. Um, so have that plan, where are you going to isolate them, how that's going to work. Um, you know, at school, you do that and then you get the parents to come and pick them up, recommending they go off for a COVID test and then um, the system takes over what happens from there. Uh, for uh, some camps and trips, you know, that can still happen very much in that same way. You're close enough. Um, there'll be a slightly longer period, obviously, but, you know, if you're within sort of an hour or so, um, then the parent coming to pick them up is realistic. You might want to add that to um, your information that goes out beforehand. I mean, most schools will have something in there about if you're, if your um, delightful student isn't behaving very well, you will be coming to pick them up from camp and we won't be taking them back to school. Um, so it's the same kind of idea. If they're sick, you will need to come and pick them up. Um, there are obviously um, situations where you're far more removed when the student gets sick. Um, you know, I've been talking to um, ones that are off to Stewart Island, for example. Um, there, it's more a case of, isolate um, that student and then get some advice. Um, public health uh, will you know, tell you exactly what you need to do. They're the experts at moving um, people around. Uh, 
I cannot imagine that they'd um, expect a school to isolate with a group of students for um, seven, seven days in a camp. Um, they'd be looking at how they um, safely get those students back into um, their home environments. Um, and they're the experts at doing that. Uh, the, you know, if there's a, a confirmed um, case in a school, there's a, you know, there's a process and that's quite well outlined in the Ministry of Education information. Um, it's got its own little tab about um, if there's a suspected or confirmed case and there's a whole lot of, um, a whole process where the principal works with the regional um, director of education um, for the ministry and public health and they work out um, exactly what's going to happen within the school, you know, who's close contacts and what needs to happen. And obviously that's a really changing um, sort of situation at the moment with, with the changes in how isolation and close contacts and timeframes are all working. So I think the key there is that get some advice um, quickly if it's not easy to get the parent to come and pick them up. Um, you should, certainly shouldn't be um, popping anyone with COVID symptoms onto um, public transport and shipping them home. Um, so think about how is a safe, pragmatic way um, to get them back to their caregivers. If it's not really obvious, get advice from public health. Uh, do you think we'll get to the stage where we require students to test before going on camp? Mm, I can't really imagine it. Um, yeah, who knows? I'd be guessing. I don't think so. Um, <laughs> But yeah, yeah. Um, other questions? Okay, if that's it, um, remember that email address when you think of your tricky questions or your particular school situation um, doesn't quite fit with the guidance. Um, more than happy to have individual conversations, answer emails, etc. Um, it's certainly a challenging time and there's definitely lots of um, situations that kind of aren't black and white um, and don't fit clearly within the um, guidance where it's being pragmatic, looking at your school settings and how things happen within schools, the level of risk within schools, and then looking at how that um, would work out in camp. Um, one thing to remember with going on camp is uh, that those kids while they're on camp have a whole lot less contacts than they would if they were um, at school for the week, going home on public transport, um, playing around with their friends down at the local park and mingling with, their, um, with all of their friends across different year groups and with their parents who have been out and working and around and about. So you, know, you can, consider camps in some ways as a much um, lower risk environment than uh, having students out, out and about all week. Awesome. Well, if that's the end of the questions, thanks everyone for um, coming on this afternoon and feel free to share uh, and email me at any stage. Right. Hi there. Thanks, Rihanna. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.